Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the great privilege of welcoming to the channel Dr. Aaron Adair. Dr. Aaron, can you please tell us about yourself, please? Yes. Uh, first off, thank you for inviting me. So yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, I am trained as a physicist. I have my PhD in physics from The Ohio State University. Earned that about a decade ago. Um, I've also had a long interest in the intersection between uh, science and religion. I'm not religious myself, but uh, once I started digging into biblical studies and realizing there was actually this uh, uh, scholarly, secular way of actually trying to understand it that was you know, evidence-based uh, rather than just um, dogmatic-based, that became a much more interesting subject matter that I've dove into. So um, I currently work as a data scientist for a company, as well as um, I'm a research affiliate at MIT, so I get to continue some of my previous physics research, as well as um, earn a decent paycheck from a normal job. Uh, and on the side, I you know moonlight as a Bible scholar. So a topic that we've never discussed on the channel before, what would be the impact on religion with the discovery of extraterrestrial life? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so this is um, the result of a project that I've been doing with my co-author, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. Um, uh, he has been an editor of one of my books from before about the Star of Bethlehem, and uh, uh, he's very philosophically minded and a very good writer. Um, we were starting to chat about this uh, paper that was in Philosophica Christi, which was trying to argue that if aliens existed, it really shouldn't have that much of an impact on theology. We were digging into that, and it was generating ideas, especially because we thought there were a lot of uh, limitations to that paper, least or maybe not least of which, but one of the ones that struck me the most was the authors of the paper have just not read enough science fiction. <laughs> That, that was apparent in a few interesting spots. Uh, so, you know, we started generating the ideas and we said, hey, we could use this to basically uh, help create the skeleton of a book length response of first deciding, can we say it's more likely than not that aliens exist on present evidence? And if they do exist, and we think probably yes, what would be then the potential impacts and things like how does the incarnation of Jesus work? Does he come to one planet or does he go to every single planet with aliens on it? Uh, how does it work with um, the problem of evil? Because whatever evils have happened on earth, well, evils have probably happened on those other worlds. And more likely than not, there are even worse evils in the universe. So if we think, say, the 2004 tsunami was absolutely terrible, well, what about a tsunami on another planet that killed 10 times as many uh, people uh, realizing, oh, this you know makes whatever the problem of evil is significantly worse. Uh, there's the issues of well, if you look at the Bible, does it even allow for the possibility of alien life? Its cosmology seems so off from what we actually know now that it doesn't seem like it allows for the possibility of something which should be pretty significant disproof because you know if the aliens show up and you know we tell them it's like well you shouldn't even be here. <laughs> that should definitely, you know, cause us to pause about our theology. So there's all these sorts of questions and we're seeing, you know, like it's mostly focused on Christianity because that's where most of the work has gone into by other astro theologians. And when I say astro theologian, it's not the um, older style, the more the astro theologian of how do we apply theology to the alien question? So there are actual professional Christian theologians trying to ask these questions and answer them. And of course, as theologians normally do, not coming to much consensus on things. Uh, so it's mostly focused on Christianity, but we also see what's the impact for Islam, for Judaism, uh, for Hinduism, uh, for Mormonism. Uh, surprisingly, the Mormons will probably be one of the best religions off if we do discover aliens, because they've been actually pro-aliens from the very beginning. Uh, uh, yeah, but so we've explored that. Uh, I was able to do some actual original scientific research for this as well to try to do better projections of how many species, intelligent species are in the galaxy right now uh, based on the famous Drake equation. Uh, and this is also based on some of my own previous research. So as background as well, when I was still an undergrad, I was able to be an intern at the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, so for one summer, I was there and able to use their radio telescopes to scan the sky and potentially see if anyone was calling us. Uh, unfortunately, nobody was um, those nights I was there, but uh, tomorrow, we never know. 
Well, I suppose the Bible believer could turn around and simply say that uh, God created everything. Mm. So that's their get out clause of, of accepting that the impact or the negative impact to mm. finding or the discovery of extraterrestrial life. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, there's uh, already the statement that, yeah, if we find life in the universe elsewhere, that just just shows how much grander the universe is, that it's now filled with life. On the other hand, if we were the only species, uh, intelligent species in the whole universe, then they would say, look at how the universe was created specifically for us. So when you realize, hey, the Christian can say whether the life, the universe is full of life, life is rare, or even life is singular, um, the Christian will say that's exactly what we always believed. Well, if any possibilities what they've always believed or can say can always fit, it's not a very good hypothesis. And even so, the question is, what are the other uh, theological impacts of that? So in some ways, it's kind of like the issue that happened in 1492 when Europeans en masse discovered, hey, there's an entire continent of people on the other side of the world. How do they fit into the salvation story? If they've always been over there, can they possibly be descendants of Adam? which actually led to a theological argument if the Native Americans were actually fully human or not, which basically was the argument between are they humans and we can um, convert them or they're beasts of burden and you treat them like you would cattle. Um, fortunately, the argument went in favor of Native Americans being fully people, but it's not like the history of Native American treatment has exactly been great. But literally, that theological argument was happening because people didn't even think it was possible that there were people on the other side of the world. Like, uh, in particular, uh, uh, St. Uh, uh, Augustine of Hippo uh, thought that the possibility of people on the other side of the world was uh, non-existent. Uh, well, he was wrong. The thing with aliens would just basically make that even grander. And unlike with uh, the Native Americans, where we can prove that they are the same species as us, Clearly, the aliens would be of a completely different uh, uh, origin of life, different genetic component. Heck, where they even have DNA, we don't know even. Uh, so how do they fit into things? If they're intelligent, if they have reason like we do, are they related to God in the same way that humans are? And of course, if they are, well, how do they fit into uh, issues of like salvation and sin? Are they a fallen species um, or are they fallen because of us? Uh, is it because of what humans did that all of a sudden the rest of all the galaxies now have to suffer because of allegedly what happened in the Garden of Eden? Or did they all individually have to fall? Or conversely as well, what if there are alien species that are unfallen, that are always in that perfect state of grace? In which case, God can make perfectly good creatures. Well, why couldn't he make us that way? There's all these questions that come up. So like either God has failed on a trillion planets or um, God has succeeded in some places, not in others, and then begging the question why he's only competent sometimes when making uh, intelligences out there. So it creates a whole number of conundrums just from the bare existence, let alone then trying to fit them into, if they are fallen, how do they get salvation? How does Jesus bring salvation to them? Is it only by acting here on earth? In which case, how do they know about what happened here on earth? Because, uh, well, while we do have radio technology now, they definitely didn't have that in 33 AD. <laughs> so if something happening in Judea 2000 years ago, you know, could only possibly been spread by word of mouth, there's no way the word of mouth could have gotten that to the other side of the galaxy, let alone to another galaxy a billion light years away. So um, is it the case that Jesus has to go and in our, in, um, incarnate himself into the bodies of aliens? And so he's now having to basically effectively do like quantum leap jumping from body to body across um, the whole known universe, and we'll have to do this as new species develop over the next trillion years. Uh, Jesus will be very busy. <laughs> Something that really stands out to me is in the number of discussions I've, I've had with Bible believers, and I have my fair share of uh, uh, hate emails <laughs> from Bible believers, the question arose that I posed to a few pastors in that given the size of the known universe why we think that god has chosen our particular planet and according to them given us this particular book why do we think that we are so significant given the size of the the known planet how 
how do you how do you counter that argument? Uh, well, actually, it sounds like it's the argument that they're the ones suffering through because um, uh, it's actually um, a problem that even exists in the theological literature. They call it the problem of particularity. Why is it that uh, the God of the universe has a chosen people or just you know a really local group that he seems to be completely concerned about? Uh, even if we say he's uh, God is completely concerned about humanity, well, why only humanity, of course, of all the trillions of possible civilizations? Uh, and of course, the fact that, uh, like, you know, within Judaism, there is a clear chosen people, so a subset of a subset, that level of particularity does not seem like what you'd expect from a universal God. It's what you expect from literally a tribal uh, deity. Uh, so yeah, that that is already a strangeness. And Honestly, the way the literature tries to deal with this is to say, uh, I guess it's either it's either the case that God does have equal relationship with all the species, or the specialness that he has with us is some sort of unresolvable paradox, which is another way of just shrugging. <laughs> so where does the research go from here? Because obviously it won't form any form of conclusion until you know we find uh extraterrestrial life and then, mm. and then therefore assess what that direct impact is with the discovery but from a research point of view where does it go from here yeah yeah uh, you're definitely right that in many ways what like the average person will do what will the religious person do once we have confirmation of intelligence out there we probably can't know very well until it happens but we at least do have some analogs to see how people react so for example back in the mid 1990s there was a news report um, coming from NASA, and it was actually announced by Bill Clinton that it looked like in a Martian rock, there were signs of bacterial fossils. And while it was an announcement of, hey, we found life on Mars, it was certainly like the sort of headline of, look, it looks like we have found ancient life on Mars. But uh, that didn't you know, cause cities to burn or uh, people to mass deconvert or anything like that. And of course, conversely, there are millions of people who think we're visited by aliens as we speak, um, either because of what they've been seeing on uh, CNN and the New York Times or Fox News, or because they've been watching the History Channel and thinking the aliens built the pyramids. Um, so there's already a lot of people who already believe that. And obviously it hasn't like, you know, ended religion for them either. In fact, sometimes it's just part of a new religion in many ways uh if you watch too much of ancient aliens and i strongly do not recommend that you do it's basically a new version of uh western esotericism uh i mean they're basically bringing in their own sort of like uh explanations for magic and uh old uh beliefs but giving them a new scientific veneer uh and sometimes they basically fall into uh the ideas of like late 19th, early 20th uh, theosophy. And so dreams also can become a real and some sort of like telecommunication with aliens across the universe. So a lot of that already exists. And so we can look to that anthropologically to see what happens, but still, it still probably comes, it's still not quite as concrete as if a flying saucer came in and landed right in front of the United Nations building. That would, I think, have an even grander impact. And we can't know for sure what will happen until then. If uh, I also worry if it happens in New York because, well, as you probably know in the U.S., uh, just about every other person has a gun. So I know someone is going to shoot at the thing. Uh, for better or for worse, that will happen. Uh, it's just a given, unfortunately. Um, how the aliens will react? Well, hopefully they have their own personal shields. Uh, we'll, we'll find out that day. Um, so what nonetheless could we do in the meantime? One of the things is, can we do more and more research to figure out the plausibility that life can develop on other planets. So when I've tried to do my own estimates on how likely intelligence is in the universe, it depends on well, how likely is it that a given planet can actually um, bring life forth. So was it the case that life developed on Mars in the past or not? Is it the case that on the, Ju uh, the Jovian moon Europa, is there life underneath its ice as we speak? Because that's actually an active possibility that uh, NASA scientists really want to drill into and find out. If we found out that life emerged multiple times in our solar system, that almost guarantees that the universe is swimming with life. And conversely, if we find 10 different places in our solar system where life could have emerged, but it only happened on Earth, then that would probably suggest life is extremely rare. 
Um, so that sort of information we could even do in our solar system over the next 30, 40, frankly, 100 years um, to see where that is. So even if we never meet any aliens, we can still at least adjust our estimates um, if they're out there. Um, so those are the things. And of course, we can continue the philosophical conversation as one sign brings up arguments, one person uh, then responds to that and you know make progress in the way philosophers try to do and at least look at the logical possibility space to see what works, what doesn't, what are the consequences of new thoughts. And in the same sort of way, theoretical physicists can make progress even without experimental evidence. It's a whole lot slower than having the evidence in front of you, but you can at least look at the possibilities. So you being a scientist, how do you, what sort of arguments do you have from fellow scientists who believe that there is a God? Yeah, so it can be very case by case basis because some people seem to be religious in the way that I would say I used to be, not even as a Catholic, but like um, for the longest time, I would actually categorize myself as a Catholic deist. Uh, there is a God, but the most perfect God is one that can set the universe and have it run on its own. A God who has to come in and keep tinkering with the machinery is not as good of an engineer as a God that can set things up correctly the first time and just let it run. So many scientists will say that, you know, God is basically um, the laws of the universe or what, you know, breathe life into the laws of the universe. And that sort of deism, then you would just, you know, respond to, well, is that actually a necessity for uh, the natural world? Or can nature exist even without something um, giving life to the equations that we have? Um, is it the case that actually the various laws of physics can exist um, on their own, that there's like some sort of logical necessity to them? So that's one way that I would you know discuss that. Others are basically straight up, um, I have a Bible <laughs> uh, and I you know have these strong beliefs about what the, the truth that, that's in there. And then the argument is about, you know, biblical scholarship and, you know, did Daniel actually write the book of Daniel? Did Moses write the five books attributed to him? Um, did, you know, Jesus walk on water and rise from the dead? And then all of those um, more or less historical arguments. And while it's not very often that I have those discussions with my um, colleagues in the physics world, um, those are the sorts of things I generally see that either it's some semi-traditional uh, form of religion or it's deism, or agnosticism, um, or even uh, out-and-out -out atheism. There are definitely some fire-breathing uh, physicists out there that are just like gung-ho against religion. <laughs> Dr. Adair, thank you for joining us on Esoteric Thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you.